Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Or this will be our third Sunday together in Psalm 23. And uh, so I welcome you to turn there one more time, as we will do probably for the next eight or nine weeks together in the study, uh, because the psalmist, led by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has recorded about 10 things that the shepherd does for the sheep. And uh, we want to look at all of those aspects for uh, these coming few weeks together as we uh, wind up 2020. And uh, so I hope you'll be faithful to uh, be with us each of those weeks. So the text today is verses 1 and 2. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. I'll come back to that, makes me in a few minutes. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still water. So when I think about green pastures and I think about still waters, I think about the term of rest and relaxation. Uh, that's one of the things that the Lord is doing in this passage, is showing us how important it is that the shepherd leads the sheep to be able to rest and to relax. Now, this is one of those sermons, and I'll probably say this again in a few minutes, one of those sermons that uh, smacked me right in the face while I was preparing. And I found out something, those sermons that hit me the hardest are usually the sermons that God uses the most in the congregation because I'm not the only one facing those kinds of issues. But this is one of those that I had to say, oh me, way too many times. Uh, it's about rest. It's about taking time off. It's about uh, relaxing as you live your life. Now, I suspect that there are many of you that fight the battle of uh, being a workaholic. Now, I don't want you to raise your hand, but uh, it's fun to be up here uh, while I'm preaching because uh, even when I use the term, people went to the person next to them uh, right off the bat. And uh, so guard your neck today. I don't want you to get in, in a crick in your neck here today. But uh, this is one of those sermons that kind of smacked me pretty hard. You might believe that you're a workaholic if you... Uh, ever work more hours in the week than you planned that you would. Uh, you might be a workaholic if you feel moody and guilty and anxious when you're not at work. Uh, you might be a workaholic when you're not at work, you spend large amounts of time checking your email from work to see if there's something that you left unfinished. You might be a workaholic if you... Uh, have tried in the past to reduce the amount of hours that you spend working a week, but without very much success. You might be a workaholic if you uh, uh, have some relationships that have been negatively impacted because you're working all the time. You might be a workaholic if you uh, don't get a good night's sleep because you're thinking too much about your work. You might be a workaholic, and I know guys like this, I know people that are like this, that you never take a vacation and you never take a day off, or very rarely. Uh, or you find it difficult in carrying on a conversation with people because you're constantly thinking about your job or your work. You might have a difficulty being a workaholic if you hide some of the amounts of time that you work from your loved one. Had somebody tell me, and I've had this several times in the last 40 years. Jay, somebody come up to me and, and uh, we'd be talking. I said, Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm off on Thursday. You mean you take a day off, Pastor? You know, the devil never takes a day off. I said, Well, do you want me to act like the devil? Because if I don't get a day off, that's about how I act. Sure enough. Then uh, um, the first 10 years of our marriage, I could, I could really, I need to probably write a book about some of this stuff. Uh, 
eight of those first 10 years, I want you to listen to this now, I, I went to school full time and I took no less than a full load. I worked 30 hours a week at Sears in Greenville, South Carolina, and I pastored a church full time. Now, you tell me, what do you think suffered as a result of, now I did this for eight years. And about the 10th year of that, uh, my marriage just about fell apart. I'm pastoring my second church. Kathy will testify to every bit of this. I, I'm pastoring my second church, telling people how to have a happy home. And my home is falling apart. Now, much of that was a, hear me a minute, much of that was a learned experience in my life. I just felt like as I was growing up that somehow if I would be an overachiever that I could gain the approval of other people that were around me. And I carried that out of my adolescence into my young adulthood and into my marriage. And I can't tell you what a tremendous day it was in Colleen, Texas on that Sunday morning when I real, and by the way, let me, let me back up just a minute. I carried that into my relationship with my heavenly father as well, which I didn't have one, but I thought if I could get one, it would be by overachievement. I could prove to God that I was worth something, that I could prove to God that I was worthy of his attention and so I set out to do that in my life and that day that God for the first time in all of my life I heard him you say was it audible no it was louder than that he said to me I love you just like you are I didn't have to work for his approval I didn't have to work for his love and I was set free from that trap. Exodus chapter number 31 says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested, and here's those two principles that we find in Psalm 23, that on that seventh day the Bible says he rested and was refreshed. Did God have to rest because he was tired? Absolutely not. God never got tired but he was setting it forth as a model for you and for me that we are to live our lives based on the goodness of God and allowing the goodness of God to live in and through each of us so I'm preaching this series on Psalm 23 because that is the theme of the whole uh, series is the goodness of God so the shepherd is caring for his sheep and he's going to identify these 10 areas by which that he cares for us. And he knows that sheep live their life restlessness and without rest, if you will, and empty and really don't understand the goodness of God. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. Has God ever made you lie down in green pastures because you were so dumb you wouldn't do it yourself? 51 years old, driven, hard at it every day, and God stretched me out physically because he knew that I wasn't going to do it myself so that I could learn some stuff about what it means uh, to be healthy in my relationship. I found out some things when God stretched me out. He did it because he cared about me. He did it because he loved me. He did it because he had a purpose and a plan that the way that I was going to go, I would never reach the end of it. Uh, now, to give God my best requires resting and relaxation. Uh, my, uh, <clears throat> I'm hoping that my personal physician, my primary care physician is listening today, uh, he and his wife, 
but I'll tell you what, God used him to save my life when I was 51 years old. And I went to him and he, he, I said, well, what, why am I like this? He said, because of stress. I said, Doc, that can't be it. I said, the more you put on me, the more I respond and the better I operate. I, the more stress that I have, the more productive that I am. And he says, he looked at me and he got, really got my attention and he said, you don't understand something. Stress goes in and it's going to come out somewhere. God knows that. And so oftentimes he has to make us. Sheep don't normally just lie down in green pastures. They don't, they don't just stretch out and rest. They have to be made. And, and, and God has to make us sometimes stretch out. Now, so as I told you a minute ago, this message kind of smacked me in the face. And uh, I want to talk to you a few minutes about why we don't get enough rest. Okay? Got a pencil? Here we go. We don't get enough rest, first of all, because we distinguish our worth based on our work, not on our relationship with God. There are a lot of people that confuse their net worth with their self-worth. Their value uh, is based upon their valuable. So we overwork so that we can uh, reach the approval or to prove ourselves. I, I've done that from the time of my youth uh, when I was just a student in school and I was growing up and I, I was wondering why my life was in the shape that it was in and why this was going on and why that was going on and why this wasn't happening and why that wasn't happening. I said, I know what I'm going to do. I, I'll gain the attention of everybody around me by excelling at sports and by excelling in academics, by picking myself up. And that's what I literally decided that I was going to do is pick myself up by my bootstrap. If they're not going to support me, if they're not going to believe in me, if they don't love me, then I'm just going to pull myself up by my bootstraps and I'll make something out of myself. And by doing so, maybe I can prove my value in this life. Um, Ecclesiastes says... Only someone too foolish to find his way home would wear himself out with work. Let me just say to you folks, life is a whole lot more than just work. Now work is part of it for a man that won't work and must not eat. But that, it's not everything about life. And you get up to thinking that your identity, who you are, is based on what you do and what your accomplishments are. Now, the second thing, the second reason we don't rest is this. We demand more and more stuff. I want you to listen to what the wisdom writer, the, the wisest man who ever lived outside of Jesus. He, he made this statement in Proverbs 23. He says, don't wear yourself out to get rich. Don't trust in your own cleverness. Cast but a glimpse at riches and they are gone. For they will surely sprout wings and fly off to the sky like an eagle. Our founding fathers knew that. It, it, that's the reason they put an eagle on the dollar of America. They know that, look at there, boop, it's gone. I, I made an observation in my life, and I, I want you to listen to this. We spend the first half of our life sacrificing our health to gain wealth. And we spend the second half of our life sacrificing our wealth to get back our health. It's the way it is. And the word of God's very clear. In, in Luke chapter 12, he says, watch out. Be on guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist of an abundance of possessions. So people overwork and don't rest because they think that it brings worth and that they just want more and more and more stuff. Third, people don't rest because they are desiring to be like somebody else. Desiring to be like somebody else. I, I've made this statement a bunch of times uh, in different sermons along the way. Uh, it's uh, people that are buying things that they don't need with money that they don't have to impress people that they don't even like. 
That, that's the way a lot of people are. They are trying to impress people. They want to keep up. We used to call it up in the mountains. They're trying to keep up with the Joneses. And I'm watching parents, even today, they're looking around and so-and-so's kids, you know, they're involved in gymnastics and they're in dance and they're in cheerleading and they're in sports. And, and, and so we got to make sure that our kids are involved just as much as those kids are involved. So we want to keep up with everybody else. My girlfriend, she, she's on social media all of the time. And so I, 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 gotta, I gotta be on social media as much as she is. And I gotta post what she's posting and look how attractive that that is. I, my, my post has got to be more creative and we wanna keep up with other people. Here, here's what the wisdom writer said in, in chapter four. He says, and I saw that all work and all achievement spring from one person's envy of another. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. And so we got to look like they do. We got to act like they do. We got to buy what they buy. And we've got to go where that they go. And we got to be like them. Do you know what that's called? Envy. Envy. It's another reason that people... Don't practice rest and relaxation. Let me give you number four. Oh, here's where we're going to get rich now. It's decide, deciding career is more important than relationships. Now, everybody in this room knows people that are just like that. They choose a career over their family, and so they will walk away from a husband or, or a wife They'll walk away from that marriage. They'll walk away from the precious kids that God has given them to parent. And they choose their jobs and their careers over the relationships that they have in their life. Here again, the wisdom writer, when he said in Ecclesiastes 4, again, I saw something meaningless under the sun. Uh, there was a man all alone. He had neither son nor brother. There was no end to his work or his toil, yet his eyes were not content with his wealth. Listen to what he said. He said, why am I working? Why am I doing all this stuff? Why am I toiling like I'm toiling? Who, who, who am I going to leave it to? I, I've given my whole life to accumulating this stuff and I walked away from my family and all of the relationships and now I've got what I look but what's going to happen to it now? This too is meaningless. A miserable business. Notice what he says at the very last phrase. Two are better than one. In other words, relationships take precedence over Careers. Let, let me just say a word to you. God did not put you here on this earth to make you the most, uh, for you to become the most successful person that you could be on the planet. He put you here to love Him with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and to love your neighbor. That's what He put you here for. When you get up to heaven, let me just assure you of something. God's not going to say to you, hey, tell me about your business. God's not going to say to you, hey, tell me about your career. Uh, tell me about how successful that you have been. I, I, I want to tell you what he's going to ask you. He's going to say, uh, did you get to know me while you were there? Did you get to know my son while you were there? Hey, did you get to know my family while you were living uh, let me just say to you, friend, you can go to work and hit a home run every day of your life, but if you come home and strike out, what good is it? All right, let me give you number five. You ready? You say, how many of these do you have? I, I have 18, so just hang on. <laughs> the reason that people don't rest and relax is that they are dreading the possibility of not having enough. I read, a, I read a story just this week about a preacher friend of mine who uh, he, had, uh, he had this big business meeting with a lot of people and they were multi, multi, multi millionaires all in the room and he was sitting there at the table with him. He got struck up a conversation with this very wealthy guy sitting beside him and he looked at him and he said, well, how much more do you think you're going to need? 
And the guy says about eh, 20, 30 more million. Wow. Let me give you a paraphrase, if I could, of Ecclesiastes 6. We work to feed our appetites, but meanwhile, our souls go hungry. In other words, we're giving up our spiritual life for our physical appetites because we've come to the conclusion, I am afraid that I don't have enough. And I'm not going to have enough. Psalm says in 127 verse 2, In vain you rise up early, and in vain you stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those that he loves. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He gives me rest and relaxation. Now, how in the world do you get out of the rat race? Because the fact of the matter is, listen, God is not going to lead you into a rat race. So how do you get out of it? How do you get in on living a life based on the goodness of God for yourself? All right, let me help you now. Our president right now is in a hospital and uh, they're giving him antidotes for a virus. And so I want you just to think with me for a few minutes. I've given you five viruses uh, let me give you five antidotes for those five viruses. First of all, you ready? Here we go. Consider how much you mean to God. Consider how much you mean to God. Somebody comes up to you and they strike up a conversation with you and they ask you, who are you? What is your first response? Do you come back to them telling them what you do for a living? Uh, that, that's a red flag if there ever has uh, been one, if that's what you do. Uh, when you ask who you are, that you tell them what you do instead. I want to tell you the greatest words I've ever heard God tell me in my life is, I love you just like you are. And when that happened, I realized, listen to this, God created me. God has a purpose for me. God has a plan for my life. I'm valuable to God. I mean something to God. He loves me. I am unique. Aren't you glad that God didn't clone more Mike Whitsons? I, 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 I'm, I'm just me. And the beautiful part is, is that Jesus died for me. He created me. He loves me as a purpose and a plan. And Jesus, if I were the only one who had ever sinned, Jesus would have died just for me. He loves me. I'll never get over that. I grew up in a world of shame about my whole life. And the only way that I knew to cover up that was to grab myself by the bootstraps and show them through the driving forces of my life that I am mattered. I'm telling you, friend, there are many of you that are right here this morning and watching on uh, the uh, internet and you're watching and you're saying you know what I did too can I just say something to you friend God loves you you matter to God he has a plan for you Jesus died for you you don't have to stay on that treadmill James 1 18 says he chose to give us birth through the word of truth that he might be kind of first fruits of all that he created and one of the things that we need to do is just say, God, help me to understand that kind of love. Help me to know that you love me. Are you a broken person? So am I. Are you a sinner? So am I. Are you perfect? No, and neither am I. Are you loved by God? Absolutely. We are loved by God. And you have an infinite worth to God. So I just encourage you here this morning, quit trying to prove yourself by work. Your worth is found in Jesus. Let me give you number two. Content yourself with what you already have. Uh, by the way, uh, by nature, us sheep are restless. By nature, we don't rest 
uh, naturally. We are discontented, if you will. And, and this thing of being content, that's a learned experience. The Apostle Paul, if you read in the book of Philippians, he'll say to you, I have learned in whatever state that I am therewith to be content. I've learned no matter the circumstances that I find myself in. I have learned no matter what comes my way to be content. And then he goes on and says, here's how I do it. Through my relationship with Jesus Christ, I have learned commitment. Uh, one day this past week, I was making some in-home visits with some people that were um, coming close to going over that River Jordan. And I, I went into an area of Charlotte that I haven't been before. And, and I just got to looking around. And, and, and there was an amazing, humongous houses out there with signs up beginning in the low 900s. Wow. You know, Union County, over 200,000 people have moved into this county since I came here in 1983. And the neighborhoods that have sprung up all around us are absolutely phenomenal, humongous homes. But you know, I've noticed something out there. There's never anybody at home. You got all of these big houses, but nobody there. You know why? They're at work trying to pay for that mess. You get me? The stress that is caused there to buy, constantly buying things that you have to work to keep up. And it sometimes, if they're not careful, it destroys relationships. I've, I've watched a lot of people die. And one of the uh, interesting things to me is the last thing that they say before they slip out into eternity. Something so beautiful. I, I actually study uh, some of that and, and, and listen very carefully. You know, uh, I've never in all my ministry ever heard anybody at the close of their life ever say, I wish I had worked more. Hmm? You're not going to come to the end of this life. Look up into the face of your loved ones and say, hey, would you show me my car one more time? <laughs> not going to happen. Matthew 6, we, we, we just finished that wonderful study in the Beatitudes. And Jesus is trying to teach us a wonderful lesson in the midst of this is that we are to relax and we're to trust him and we're not to get preoccupied with the things of this world so we can be resting in the goodness of God. Number three, boy, now I know I'm really talking to the choir at this point because you are here today and you're watching and live streaming. But confine my work to six days a week. Confine my work. If I'm going to rest in the goodness of God, if I'm going to allow the goodness of God to flow through my life, then I've got to have a Sabbath day in my life. It's one, of, it's one of God's top ten, by the way. It's that fourth commandment. It's in the same context as murder and adultery. That, that we're to work six days, but we're to have a Sabbath and we are to rest. And, and understand something. This is not for God's benefit. It's for our benefit. Because God knows that if I break one of his laws, it's hurting me. We're to have a day off for rest and we're at a day off for worship. And, and maybe let me just give you a little tidbit. Is uh, Maybe you ought to start calling it uh, a Sabbath day. This is my Sabbath day. Uh, rather than um, saying it's my day off. Because if you call it a Sabbath day, you're probably less likely uh, to cheat uh, when you do that. Um, so you have that day off. There are three reasons. It, it, it helps your body, it helps your emotions, and it helps you to stay and refocus on your spiritual life uh, with the Lord. Hey, listen, listen to me very carefully. 
um, I'm going to speak as your pastor just a second. I promise you, I promise you, if you'll set that day aside, that sixth day, that seventh day, work six days, take, you know what, you're going you're gonna to wind up with more time than you ever thought that you could have. Make sure you set that time away for the Lord. Number four, correct your priorities. Correct your priorities. If, if you learn to rest, then you've got to learn that there are some things in this life that are not really important. By, by the way, keeping up with the Joneses is not important. You've got to reprioritize your life. Mark chapter, six, uh, chapter 8, verse 36. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Number five in this antidote, if you're going to rest and relax in Jesus, you got to convert my pain for his peace and my restlessness for his relaxation. When I do that, I'm going to have to be really, really careful that I watch my life, that I don't veer off from the path that God has intended for me for his power to be able to work through my life. Take your Bible, if you will, and look to Matthew chapter 6. Uh, we've referred to it a couple of times already today, and, and, and then we just spent uh, 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 an enormous amount of time recently uh, in that area. But I want you to look with me beginning in verse 26. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 26. Behold the fowls of the air, for... They sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns. Yet, your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for the clothes that you wear? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed up like them. Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall not much more clothe you, O you of little faith. Many of you are here this morning and you are tired emotionally. Physically, you are absolutely worn out Spiritually, you're at the place that uh, you are dried up. You know, one of, one of the times when you, sometimes when you confront people like that, they'll say, yeah, preacher, I just need a good vacation. Maybe you need a little more than that. Maybe you need a relationship with Jesus. Maybe you need the goodness of God to live in you and through you. Can I just say to some of you that I, I do it with all of the love in my heart. You are not made by God to live like you're living today. And if you don't slow down, God's going to make you lay down. Matthew 11 says, Come to me all you who are weary and burdened. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you'll find rest for your souls for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. God loves you. He proved it through the death of his son Jesus on the cross. And he loves you just like you are. You don't have to go fix anything. You don't have to go stop anything. You don't have to go change and rearrange a bunch of stuff to come to God. You can come to God just like you are. And I invite some of you to do that today. All of you that don't know Jesus, I invite you to come to faith in him. To let him live his life in you and through you. And to learn what it means to rest in his goodness. 
to relax in the purpose and the plan that God has laid out just for you in your life. Some of you are here today, and you know exactly what I mean. You think work's everything. And you think that the best thing you can do for your family is just work, 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 work. And you're sacrificing them on the altar of your career and your success. And if you don't change, it's going to cost you dearly. I want to ask you to rearrange some priorities that you have. Put Jesus first in your life. Put your family in that right place where they need to be. Taught my family from day one, ever since that 10th year in our marriage, family came first to me. I've tried to teach my family that. My little granddaughter, she's going to be walking down the aisle here in a few hours. Part of her wedding ceremony is that God is first. And then there's family. And we're taught to work hard after that. But to get those priorities in order. Some of you need to get your priorities right. I'm going to ask you to just come in a minute and find a place around this altar and say, you know what, God? I got things out of balance. I got things out of whack. Some of you need to bring your family down here and say, you know what? I, I, I haven't proven to you that you're first in my life. You need to make that right. Why don't you stand with me and let's just pray together for a minute, okay? Would you do that with me? <clears throat> Lord Jesus, thank you for the privilege to just gather around your word here for a few minutes. Sometimes, Lord, the word's hard to swallow. Sometimes it's hard to admit Sometimes it's very difficult to confess. But Lord, you said in your word, if we would confess our sins, you are faithful and you're just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. God, may that be so today in many people's hearts and lives. I pray for our internet audience, many of them right there in their homes right now. I pray, God, that that uh, sofa or that recliner would become an altar. I pray that these steps here in the building would become an altar. Lord, that we could uh, really make it right with you. I pray that you'd get glory in this invitation. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fpcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.